everybody. It's nice to see you again. This is the 11th time that we've done this idea networking session where we bring together instructional designers and educators to um, hear some stories about how former educators got into the field of instructional design. Just an overview of the session. So what's going to happen, we're going to hear from five, uh, three different speakers, each of them for about five minutes, and they're just going to informally talk about where they came from and how they got to where they are now. I don't know if I said my name. My name is Sharon Chaden Glass. And um, if I've never met you before, I'm really happy that you're here. And I'm happy to create this space so that people can learn more about this field. Um, the, the order of the speakers tonight is uh, Lindsay first, Lindsay Garcia, and then Kathleen Volk. And Marie, I did not ask how you say your name. How do you say your last name? Oh, Moran. Moran. Yeah. Moran. Like M M O R A N. Same way. Okay. Moran. Yes, she will be uh, the last person. So I'm going to hand it over to Lindsay first. So let me get you spotlighted, Lindsay. And it's all yours. Be on the big screen. Hi, I'm Lindsay. Um, <laughs> I was, to begin with, I was a teacher for about seven, seven years. I graduated back in 2010 with my bachelor's in elementary education, um, and I enjoyed teaching, uh, but as I got more into the public school system and into teaching, I realized that I love the aspect of education and instruction but I didn't really want to be in the classroom anymore. So um, two years ago, I decided to look into my master's. And I don't know, as you're all educators, you might be aware, um, there's American College of Education online. It's completely online for educators. I looked into some of their degrees and they're all education degrees, um, but I ran across instructional design. So as I did a little more research about what jobs that would pertain to and what it would include, I decided to go for that degree. So it took me about a year. And during that time I got pregnant. So that was a very, very busy year. I was teaching full time, side job, school, uh, pregnant. But uh, the baby came a little bit before I was supposed to graduate. So I ended up graduating later um, in that year, but in 2019. So I stayed as a teacher for a while, uh, for about a year because of the baby. I didn't really do anything with that degree. I didn't do anything with networking. I didn't do anything. So uh, then COVID hit and March, we were sent home remote working. And I thought to myself, wow, I have a kid at home. I have a little more free time because I'm not going into the classroom as much. So why don't I look into what I need to do to get this ID degree of use so I can change my career? So I started applying for jobs. I started researching uh, what I needed, portfolio, had no idea what that was, uh, didn't know what to do with that. So I just kept looking at job postings and all these skills that I just didn't have. And so uh, I read a, a, a great blog that helped me figure out, okay, if I can't get a job because I have no experience um, and I don't have a portfolio and all I have is a little bit of stuff from my master's program, um, they said you could reach out to some nonprofits in your community. So I reached out to uh, the American Foundation for Lupus. Um, and that's something close to my heart. And they reached back out to me and pro bono, I did some projects for them. And that built up my portfolio with some artifacts, but it also kind of introduced me into working with SMEs, working with clients. So it was a really great experience. Highly recommend that if um, you are looking for a way to obtain some products for your portfolio. Um, at that point, I felt a little more secure, still applying for jobs. This is uh, last summer. So last July, I was just applying. I never got callbacks. Um, I got two interviews out of like 200 applications. So I did end up taking a contract role um, for an instructional design coordinator. And at the same time, I was accepted into an academy called eLearning Launch that um, I just happened to uh, the man who founded it, I happened to apply, uh, excuse me, I connected with him on LinkedIn. Um, and luckily, my pro master's program asked me to do a LinkedIn because I had no idea what it was. And I felt like it's changed my life, honestly, with the connections I've made. So I saw he posted for a free seat in one of his enterprise 
uh, ID courses and he accepted me and it was eight weeks. I had the new job working, you know, uh, contract, but I had that going on at the same time. And I just continued through his academy. I really liked the live cohorts and things. So I started building more skills. I started realizing, oh, there's all these job postings out there and they all want video editing. They want storyline. They want, um, you know, working with SMEs. They want being able to write learning objectives, all of these things. Uh, and the academy really helped me gain those skills. Um, and just so about eight months after being in the academy, just last month, um, I was reached out to for a contract role from one of the teachers actually in the academy recommended me to a company um, for visual design. So they reached out to me and they said, you know, we really love you to work contract. After two weeks working contract with them, they offered me a full time position. Um, and I really I'm really grateful for it because it's a wonderful company. But it only it took me eight months. So I started applying last July and I put in a lot of work and a lot of nights at the academy. They're all live cohorts at night. So they're they're really nice because you get to meet a lot of people who are on the same path as you, for, but from different backgrounds. Um, and having a two year old daughter, it was really tough. So luckily I had my husband at home to help me out, but I just put in a lot of work. Uh, but it, it paid off because now I have the job I was dreaming that I would be able to have in five years. <laughs> so to be honest, um, I really feel like building my skills, not just one skill, but a bunch of different things that employers are looking for within the field of learning and development and instructional design really helped me get where I am today. Um, so that's that's my story. Awesome. I just want to um, put one question to you that uh, Jan has. She is asking, how, does e-learning launch cost money and how much does it cost? It does cost money. Um, we are all educators, though, I believe, or most of us are. So they do offer a discount. And that's how I um, I was the first class I was uh, accepted for free because it was his first class he did. But after that, I did buy an annual bundle, um, which, you know, I can share a link and all the information. But, you know, you could pay per class. So per course you want. Some courses are four weeks, some are eight. Um, but he's got a lot of different options and he does give a discount to teachers and then frequently like just for Memorial Day, he gave 30% off for teachers. So um, the pricing, um, I don't know, Sharon, if you want me to wait till I have a group or you want me to share. Yeah, some let's, of that yeah let's probably do that. Um, okay. So if you have lots of questions about e-learning launch, make sure you um, stop in Lindsay's room and then you can um, have a more point of discussion about that. Kathleen, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, Kathleen, you're up. I would just like to say I was a classmate of Lindsay's as well in a micro learning cohort. So that's where we first interacted. Oh, cool. um, I'm also upskilling through Tim Slade's Academy and I'm a few weeks into that. So very different approaches to the same topic of um, honing your instructional design skills. So I'd be happy to talk more about that too. So in terms of how I got into L&D and, and more specifically into instructional design, you know, like many of us, a lifelong passion for teaching and learning and never really could find my niche, to be honest. I first started out and said, well, I want to be a high school teacher. And then I said, well, I don't want to deal with the discipline or with parents, especially. So then I went to grad school, got a master's in English and said, well, I, I want to be an English professor. But at that time, there was a word of warning put out saying, you will never get a job. And that's even more so true today with higher ed professionals, with PhDs, especially in the humanities, saying there's like a 16% chance you'll ever get a full-time job. And so I said, well, I really love English. I really love teaching, but I don't think those chances are in my favor. So in grad school, I did some career coaching and wound up on the staff side of the house in higher education, working in learning centers. So in the areas where tutoring and academic skill development take place in universities. So I had a 13 year career in that area and wound up being very successful on even a national level. So I have peer reviewed journal articles, book chapters, and those more professor like things. I was able to do those in that role, but really in my heart of hearts, what I loved was working with the students, which is where many of us are and I think where we all draw our, our inspiration still in these in these difficult and weird times that we've been in really saying well you know thinking about 
that student experience. And so what I did in learning centers was really that academic skill development. So those topics like time management, test preparation, test taking, I did one on one coaching as well as workshops on those topics. I also supervised tutoring programs. So I would have 70 to 90 college students per semester who reported to me they needed training, mentoring, direction, and occasionally the discipline word came up too. And um, really trying to grow those tutoring programs into a dynamic curriculum. And that was one of my flags saying instructional design would be good for me. I really love developing curricula, really love kind of that piecing the puzzle together and, and working that out. And I also coached graduate students in learning strategies one on one and, and did workshops in that arena as well. So again, a lot of that one on one coaching learning strategizing and of course, I was really the SME for the tutor training as well as the person designing developing delivering that training to my teams as well. And where I really found my way to instructional design was when I was charged with moving my tutor training partially online. So obviously when I had that many students in order to do that training at the beginning of the semester, it was just like a mosh pit, you know, saying, wow, you have 70 to 90 students who all have busy, you know, they have athletics and other obligations and other jobs and their courses and really trying to fit that training in and knowing that I wanted my training to be, there's an international certification and saying, well, I really wanted to follow that certification model, but how do I do it in the amount of time and the amount of topics and the delivery and, and make it dynamic? I worked at a university where the students were very much consumers. They would tell you, that sucked. Don't ever do that training again. Or, hey, I loved it. That was super useful. You know, they'd come back to me as nurses or professionals out in the field and say, I still use how you taught me how to do this or how to approach this. And so that for me, again, was really drawing me towards instructional design. But really that pivot point for me was being told, you have to move part of it online. It's just kind of unwieldy. And so really intuitively, I didn't even know I was using Addy. I didn't know what Addy was. But looking back on it, I was really using that model, that process in terms of saying, how do I convert everything I used to do in person in a group activity slash lecture slash breakout group sort of format? How do I convert it to an online curriculum? And how do I deliver it? And how do I get feedback from the learners and engage with them? And so I really didn't know I was doing instructional design, but I was doing instructional design in that sense, kind of a, a progenitation of it, if you will. And I also had a committee of my employees because they were very hungry for professional development, even from age 18 to 22. And I would gather them together and I just said, it's a training evaluation committee. And again, we were using Addy. I didn't know what Addy was, but we would go back, take a look at the training activities in the curriculum, really dig into them, pick them apart, reprototype them, test them out, design the evaluation measures, all those things that IDs do. It was kind of like I was the lead with 10 to 12 of my students then involved in that process too. And so for me, when I was starting to think ahead saying, okay, things don't look good for higher ed. And that's been a thing in that field since before COVID. There's a projected demographic cliff and a large amount of college and university closures that are anticipated coming up here in the next decade. So for me, I said, I wanna make a career change into something that's still using my skill set, something that would be logical, not gonna require a ton of retraining. And so therefore, as I looked around and I was looking more into learning and development broadly, I said, hey, I was already doing a lot of things like an ID. So I wound up taking a very generalist training role at an aerospace manufacturer. So you can't get much different from a university learning center to a factory floor, but that's where I'm at now. Um, we make metal parts for commercial air as well as defense um, parts, fighter jets, tanks, those sorts of things, all engine related. And um, I have a lot of advice for how to make a change and be more purposeful because for me, I knew I was ready to make the change and I needed to pull that bandaid off. However, you know, hindsight is 2020. It's the old adage. And so, you know, looking back, for instance, they call everything training really, um, you know, I'm running the LMS. I'm doing audit reporting. I'm of course creating e-learning. I'm, I'm doing lots of training related things. However, they just kind of use training as a blanket term. And so I have a lot of ideas for you in terms of the right questions you can ask when you get to that job search and that interview phase as well to be sure that you're going to be doing the type of training and developing what you want to develop. 
in that sense too. But for me, you know, I've learned a whole new industry. I've learned a lot of engineering and a, and a lot of sheet metal production that I never thought I would know two years ago. And, and I've built a lot of successful relationships with SNEs. For me, it was a good move to go to a very small company that's family owned where people are very hands-on. So that's been a really high point for me moving into the field. And really I'm the sole trainer. So I do everything. I go out and take pictures and media for the courses. I do the design process, the development, um, the whole nine yards. So really for me, when I say generalist, I'm, I'm all around the board in that sense, but I'd say about 70% of what I'm doing is design and development as well. So if you have any other questions, I'd love to see in the breakout room or you can feel free to put them in the chat. Thank you. It sounds like a super cool job, the fact that you get to you kind of do it all, like all the media gathering and putting it together and ordering it. and. Yeah, it's gotten me out of my comfort zone because definitely in this role where I light up, just like in higher ed, was in the design process. Mm -hmm. So when I sit down with those SMEs and we're first, you know, working out the plan agreement, the design document, thinking about the media, that's where I'm having fun. But it's actually, you know, editing the video that I'm kind of eh, <laughs> in that sense, too. But, you know, being able to do it all, it's, it's definitely building my skill set. Awesome. I love it. Okay, I think we have one more person before we go to breakout rooms, and that is Marie. And let me find you, Marie. There you are. Okay. That's me. All right, Marie, we're ready. Okay. Uh, thank you so, so much for inviting me. I, I wish I had something like that when I was transitioning to ID. That would have helped a lot. So a little bit about me. I've been in instructional design for about 10 years, and I'm currently a senior instructional designer in a credit union in Vancouver, Canada. Um, and I specialize in what I love the most is e-learning and leadership development. That's what I uh, enjoy the most. A little bit about me, before that I was a teacher and I always knew that I was going to be teaching as a kid. I remember that learning made me feel alive and that's ultimately what I wanted to do. Um, and I also really loved different culture and languages and so it was a natural fit for me to go for um, um, teaching French as a second language. So it's very similar to English as a second language or TESOL in many ways. You have many opportunities to travel and you have a big network. So I went to Kenya for six months to teach French in a university and I taught adult uh, French in different business French, uh, conversational French in London, UK for four years. But after four years, I felt like I needed something more and I applied for a job with the French embassy to actually move to the US uh, to support a French teacher in Texas, Oklahoma and Arkansas. And that's what I did. Um, and during that time, I did, I used a lot more technology than I, than I was doing previously. I would have um, used social media, I would create communication uh, materials, marketing materials. I was organizing teacher training, events, um, educational exchanges. And so by doing that, I realized, even though I didn't know what instructional design was, I think when I first had my degree in teaching, I realized that instructional design really combined everything that I liked doing and all of the skills that I wanted to develop. Um, so I decided to, to go back to a master's degree and very similar to Nidzi in many ways. I was pregnant at the time and I thought, crazy me, I thought, well, <laughs> you know, I'm going to have a lot of time and babies sleep a lot. So I'm going to have a lot of time to study. Uh, and so that's what I did. And I cried a lot. But at some time, <laughs> it's the best thing I ever did. I'm really glad I went back. Um, I think you don't need to have a master in instructional design to become an instructional designer. But for me, I really felt the need to learn more about it and to have the confidence to become one. At the same time, I moved from the US to Canada, so it was like a new country, a new baby, a new career, um, and it did take me a while to actually find the job that I wanted. Um, at first, I mean, I had lots of interviews that I, you know, I, I didn't get the job, and um, I, I, during that time, I tried to learn a lot of tools like Articulate, uh, Cantasia, Beyond, trying to create an e-learning resume to have something a bit different. Um, and, and I took, I did an internship and I took a small contract that was ultimately not 
a, a long-term thing, but really gave me a lot of experience. And when I did get that interview that gave me my first job, I had a portfolio and I had things to show and that person in front of me saw all of the uh, transferable skills that I gained from teaching and, and um, different experiences. For me, teaching is honestly the best way to get into instructional design. I feel like it, it is the same job. It is planning for uh, learning and teaching, anticipating what your learners or students will feel and what they would need to learn better. Um, and um, I, I, I think this is the best job for me being an instructional designer because I learn every day and I really love helping people grow and, and learn along the way. Um, and for everybody that think about transitioning to instructional design, I think it's a great time with the past year and the pandemic. If there is such a boom uh, for learning and development professional for instructional designer. And you can tell from just being on LinkedIn that a lot of people are trying to develop their learning and development department, creating one, having instructional, uh, an instructional designer in house. Um, and really, um, if I had to give a few advice is redo your resume, maybe not based on your job title, but based on the skills that you have. Uh, build a portfolio, even though it's, even if it's small, it doesn't matter. It could be like little, little pieces of things that you can show off. Um, be on LinkedIn and be active on LinkedIn. Show that you are reading, that you attend webinars and conferences and you stay up to trends with everything that's going on. And there are so many resources right now, uh, especially with COVID. I feel like I've had more networking events that I've had in my entire life in the past year. Because since it's online, I can be in any country that I want. Like I've had um, um, a networking event with instructional designer in France at one time. And then I have another one with the US and another one with Canada. And it feels like a, uh, it feels like there is a lot of resources to build your knowledge those days. So that's it about me. Thank you. Okay, welcome back everybody. Before we um, open it up to a whole group q and I wanted to mention that the next time that we have a session is Tuesday, July 6th, 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern. And um, I know that time doesn't work for everyone. I'm really sorry. Um, if you can't make it live, I always make the recordings available. And I wanna make sure before I forget that I put into the chat the feedback form if you want to give me feedback on today's session. And Diego, I see your hand raised. Do you wanna, do you wanna ask the first question? Can I? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, well, I was one of the groups and it was really great. Thank you for, um, you know, organizing this. And I just got scared when I saw my face because <laughs> um, I'm not used to, I'm used to like the, you know, the little squares, whatever. Um, and, you know, we were discussing this question and then, you know, we were brought, but we were brought here. So, you know, like we couldn't finish, but it was about portfolios. Mm -hmm. You know, because a lot of you guys have portfolios. Um, like I come from this academic background and like when you do a master's degree in instructional design, you also create a portfolio. But what that is, is you show samples of your work, like if you, you know, working on a class and doing this. So it's not real portfolio, I guess. But when you start getting uh, experience in the field, like, you know, you work for a company, so you make a video for them. You work, you work somewhere else. So all of these things that you are building, you know, technically that should be part of your portfolio, but you may not be able to share that mm -hmm. because of intellectual property that's not yours, you know, like you cannot show their faces. And so I really wanted to ask about portfolios, like how do you make them? What do they look like? What can you put there? What can you not put there? That was kind of my question. Does anybody want to talk about portfolios? I, I'll Would talk a little bit. Okay. Sure. Um, I shared mine with my group but it looks like it might have sent to the everyone. So I don't know if it'll show in the comments, but I did share my portfolio. Um, I feel like, like what you're saying, Diego, is very relevant because you'll work for companies and if it has anything to do specific with their company, that's some, they're usually not gonna let you use it. Um, so a few recommendations, one would be um, 
doing stuff you really like. So if you're really, if you enjoy storyline, they have the um, e-learning heroes community where you can go onto their community and they'll give, they have like new challenges every week of creating something within storyline. And it, it's not like a whole module. It's like a tab interaction or a scenario or something very simple um, or difficult, depending on <laughs> uh, what you decide to make. But you could, those are yours and you could use that um, as an artifact for storyline. Um, I built my portfolio technically based on the Academy. So like I said, I took Camtasia. There's artifacts for Camtasia video editing. I took Storyline. I took um, a portfolio self-paced course he, he offers that actually helped me build my portfolio in Google Sites and he gave me feedback on it. Um, micro learning, what else? Oh, augmented reality. So I have a lot of artifacts of our augmented reality. And what I was just telling my group was when it comes to portfolios, you know, a lot of us, when we're first getting into a field, think boring, professional, straight to the point. And I feel like I kind of went the opposite route. I like design and I like color. Um, so my portfolio is me. And I, you know, I feel like I've gotten a lot of responses about my portfolio. I posted it on LinkedIn and a few people wanted to use it for groups like this to share. Um, so I just feel like you want to put your best work. You don't want to put all your work either. Um, you can, I don't know if you can, if he can unmute himself, but he seems to have another question. Yeah, no, I just like, let's oh, go ahead. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I would love to see your portfolio, uh, because it would be a great example. So basically what you're saying is that you are developing your own materials, you know, like to put in your portfolio because you're not allowed to use anything, any work that you would do for a company. Now, right? to, if tech, okay, so I've done contract work and part of my contract with them was I'd like to use this in my portfolio or part of it. And they've had, have, have accepted that. Now, if you're working for a company that's building for say another company, no, like you're going to be signing. There's, you can't, usually you cannot do that. Um, so it's definitely something to discuss if you're leaving a job. Like I, I worked at the long-term contract because it didn't have their name in it, they let me use one of my storyline uh, designs because it was basically how to um, navigate a website that was public. So it really depends what you're making, but yeah. Cool. Um, okay, uh, anybody else questions? I would say um, also for your portfolio, studies have shown that even hiring managers spend what? less than a minute and a half on it. So, you know, we put so much time and agony and creativity into it. And it's one of those things, I mean, it's almost like you pick up a cookbook and you page through it and say, oh, do I want to buy this? Or do I like these recipes or not? It's kind of like that. So in that sense, don't psych yourself out is my advice. You know, you kind of have to get started and you can always keep tweaking as you keep designing and you keep growing your skills too. So you have to start somewhere with it and just remember that chances are the hiring manager isn't going to sit and uh, pour over every detail of it for hours. It's more so going to be a, hey, you have some skills. Let's go. Yeah. And Marie wants to add on to that, I think. What I like the, the most in portfolios is the story behind it. Like, really, it's not about what you show as much as what's your process. What was the situation? What was the task, the result, the action, um, the actual and the result? <laughs> Um, and so, yes, those portfolios that I really love, there is a short story for each and sometimes only one screenshot, but the story is, is, is great. So that's um, maybe building stories. Cool. Um, other questions out there? I will use this opportunity to say that um, if it's Something that you're thinking about doing um, and you're not really sure if you can do it, um, I would just say, just do it. <laughs> you're, you're already qualified and you just, you know, you need to learn a little bit of a new skill set. Um, so if nobody, nobody has told you yet that you can do it, you can totally do it. It's really not that different. Um, I see Diego has another question. Are you ready, Diego? I mean, nobody else asked questions. Uh, that's I'm like, true. okay, I'm gonna that's go with the true. second Everyone one. Else is quiet, so you can ask yeah. another question. What's up? So we were, um, you know, I was with uh, Marie and her group, and, and so another thing that we discussed, I know Marie said, 
you know, there are two types of uh, instructional designers. <laughs> the ones that work in higher education with professors and people like that, and the ones that work in the industry. And she said that it was really hard to actually transition between both of them, you know, and I kind of agree with that. I mean, I don't know. I have experience, like I work in higher education. Like I told Mary, if I were to uh, look for a job in, you know, like in a car company, like a manufacturer, they will be like, you have no idea what you're doing, you know? And so, um, and it seemed like Mary felt the same way about transitioning from the industry to higher education. And so I wonder what other people think about it. Like, do you think that's true? Or do you think that's just us thinking that? And just one person at a time, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I was oh. interrupted by my child. Anyone no, 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 else? you're fine, I was just a joke. <laughs> for, for me, higher ed was all I knew. I mean, I'm not kidding you, the only other job I'd ever had was probably babysitting. I mean, I, I was a <laughs> work study student and then I did grad school and then full-time higher ed. So for me then to make this abrupt transition, it was tough. And I frankly had no orientation to the company and what they actually did. And I didn't realize that part of my job was really understanding all this engineering stuff. Mm -hmm. So I guess my, um, the proof is in the pudding in terms of being an active learner and knowing who to ask questions of and not being afraid to do so. Oh, you know, yeah. really just saying, okay, I'm going to call up the quality manager and I'm going to say, what does this mean and how does it impact what I'm doing creating this training? Mm -hmm. And really then that helped build my credibility. They said, well, she doesn't know, but at least she has the moxie or the motivation to learn it. And that I feel like built me a really positive reputation at the company saying, hey, she's willing to learn. She's not just going to listen to all this technical mumbo jumbo and shut down. Yeah. Or worse, pretend that you know what you're doing. <laughs> like just totally. I've I've had a lot of messes to clean up from that in the past, Sharon. Yes. <laughs> or be like, absolutely. Just admit it's fine to not know everything, isn't it? It's kind of refreshing to be like, you know what? I have no idea what's going on. And you know, our SMEs love to teach us things. They're they geek yeah. out about what they're experts on, by and large. I mean, even if they're extreme introverts, they still love teaching me about the proper way to pick out a ladder yeah. and set it up. So, you know, in that sense, I, I feel like the SMEs can give you a lot of information that kind of can be too much need to know yeah. information, but it helps you get better at your job and have more contacts too. So I agree though, it's very scary to leave everything you've known. It's, it's pretty terrifying. All right, Lindsay, you can have the final word. Um, I was just going to say, I don't have experience in higher education. I have experience in elementary education, transitioning from that to instructional design. Um, and I was telling, we were discussing that in my group, how you kind of have to turn off sometimes your teacher brain, the way you think about just the learner, because if you're talking about um, enterprise ID, a corporate ID, where you're not necessarily working within the higher education, now you're working for a business and they have needs and you need to be able to take your problem solving skills to solve their needs. And like Kathleen was saying, you, you know, you have to learn a lot of things within their industry or whatever their corporation is trying to train their employees or others. Um, you have to be able to put that cap on. So it's really important to be able to talk to a variety of people like SMEs and um, the clients and the employees. What are their problems? What are the things that they're encountering? So it definitely, um, it might have a little bit of a change, I feel like between um, higher you know, higher education and um, the corporate setting based on what problem are you solving? You're mm -hmm. not just focusing on the learner's needs. You're focusing on the business needs and how yep. you're going to make that work. So your learners end up doing what the business needs. Um, so it's just that frame of mind. Um, cool. All right. Um, that is it, I think. I like to end a little bit early so everyone can go go to sleep or whatever else you need to do. Um, I will just say thank you um, to Marie and Lindsay and Kathleen for coming and sharing your experiences with us. I really appreciate you guys taking your time and um, just helping other people become encouraged to try something new if teaching is um, not for them anymore. And I hope to see you guys back here uh, July 6th, 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern. And um, I will see you then. Have a great night, everybody. Bye.